Good evening and welcome to Friends of Science Society's 18th annual event online. I'm Michelle Sterling, Communications Manager for Friends of Science Society, and I'd like to welcome you to part two of our event, Politicians Can't Stop Climate Change. The first part we did on October the 2nd, it's recorded and online with Dr. Rus Burkhout of Clintel, the organization out of Holland that has an international cadre of signatories of more than 900 scientists and scholars who say that there's no climate emergency and we do have time. So that was our science section for this year. And tonight, part two, will be our political section. And we're gonna have a very interesting guest, Mark Morano of Climate Depot. Now, Mark has been a climate activist of his own kind for many years, and he's an author of many important books in the world of climate change, mostly because his books are very plain language. They make it very easy for people to understand not only the science, but also the implications of climate policies. And that's really what we have to be aware of these days. Because we're not talking now about you putting on a sweater and turning down the heat a little bit to save the planet. Now we're talking about gas prices skyrocketing. We're talking about food shortages. We're talking about oil, natural gas, coal prices skyrocketing and energy shortages. and. These may not be just a temporary situation because of global markets. A lot of this is exactly what climate activists want. And Mark has written a very interesting book that's just come out called Green Fraud, Why the Green New Deal is Worse Than You Think. And we're going to be touching on some of the points he makes in that book tonight in his presentation. And his presentation is called uh, The Green New Deal, the great regret. So first of all, we're going to see his pre-recorded presentation. And during it, you can uh, write down some notes for yourself. We have the live chat going on our YouTube uh, stream. So please, if you have questions as you go along, just write question and then put your question in. We have moderators who are going through the questions and comments as they go by and they'll pull them out and send them to me so that I can ask Mark during our live Q&A, which will happen after his presentation. So without further ado, let's roll the pre-recorded presentation of Mark Morano with the Green New Deal, The Great Regret. Hi, this is Mark Morano from Climate Depot, and I want to thank Friends of Science for the opportunity here to speak tonight. The topic is climate hustle. Governments can't control the Earth's climate, no matter how much they think they can. So let's, let's begin. My first book, first of all, came out in 2018. I actually updated it in 2019. It's the Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change. And this book is your A to Z compendium on everything related to the climate debate. I think you'll find it a very fascinating book. It was actually um, updated in 2019 with a bonus chapter on the Green New Deal. And then, of course, the Green New Deal blew so big that I ended up doing a whole book on the Green New Deal called Green Fraud. In September 2020, uh, uh, last year, about a year, a little over a year ago, we released Climate Hustle to Rise of the Climate Monarchy. This featured uh, Kevin Sorbo as a narrator, me as your humble correspondent, and we essentially went through the entire uh, climate debate from the Green New Deal to the UN Paris Agreement to all the wacky solutions to all the uh, proposals to go out to meat eating, shrinking humans, etc. Kevin Sorbo does a fantastic job. Highly recommend this film, uh, Rise of the Climate Monarchy, Monarchy uh, Climate Hustle 2. A little bit about my background besides that, I used to work in the U.S. Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. And this picture here is taken on the streets of Paris in Paris, France, in 2015, December, when I had uh, my film, the first Climate Hustle film came out, and they put wanted posters of me all over on the morning of the premiere. 
And this actually prompted the New York Times to cover our movie premiere. We actually ended up having the police have to shut it down because of all the protesters that showed up. We were at an old movie house in Paris. Uh, but this is just an example, and I'm not sure what that disgusting-looking substance is on the sidewalk there. But And then, of course, my book, Green Fraud, which came out in March 2021 this year, Features a forward by Mark Stein, which if you if you know anything about Mark Stein, the book itself is worth getting just to read Mark Stein's hilarious uh, forward in this book. Uh, the, why the Green New Deal is even worse than you think, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. The reason, by the way, it's even worse than you think has to do with COVID and the idea that we can now declare any kind of emergency and politicians can suspend normal democracy and just impose the policies they want. We're finding that that works very well in the climate uh, debate as well as the COVID uh, debate. But this book, uh, has, it's, it's out there, it's doing very well as well. And this book covers all uh, aspects of the Green New Deal and climate policy. I do have one whole chapter in this book on the uh, uh, climate science. So I go into uh, a lot of the climate, traditional climate claims. It's actually in the form almost of like a talking point or Q&A format. So I think you'll find, readers will find that very uh, easy to read. But I go into the history of the Green New Deal here. I talk about the sustainable development movement. You can literally see the same language from the UN sustainable development as used in the Green New Deal. And I go into the whole, whole chapter devoted to the children's climate movement. Also, I have two chapters, one on the COVID climate connection, one on the Great Reset. Um, and in addition to that, I go to the toxic politics of the Green New Deal. I talk about Europe and how they're much further advanced uh, than the United States or even Canada with their Green New Deal and how they're facing worse energy prices, skyrocketing prices, blackouts. And that's, of course, our future if we follow down the same path uh, as Europe. Uh, but in addition to that, I, I go through... Uh, I also talk about how identity politics has invaded the climate debate, which we'll get to a little bit in today's uh, talk. And Mark Stein has been actually very helpful in this. He's offered to autograph any book, uh, who, who anyone who buys it off of his website, Stein Online. And the reason for that is there's been pressure on Amazon to uh, pull my book and to ban it because Amazon's supposed to be a, quote, climate champion. And how dare they sell a climate denier book? In addition to that, there have been, I was at a Steamboat Institute conference here in the United States and a local bookstore, which they normally carry all the books, refused to carry my book. Uh, so they're, they're, you know, climate books that don't follow the United Nations narrative are under fire right now. And that's why Mark Stein stepped up and is offering to autograph anyone who buys a copy of Green Fraud, who he wrote the foreword with, uh, from his website. So I like to talk, when I talk to general, obviously, friends of science probably doesn't need this little history lesson, but in general, I like to give the little quick, what I call um, uh, very uh, user-friendly, uh, easy to understand general public talking points on climate science. Geologically speaking, the Earth is currently in a CO2 famine. Ice ages have occurred when CO2 was 2,000 levels. We're only at uh, a little about 4,410 4, today, 8, 000, and as high as 8,000 RPM. PPM. Temperatures have been similar to the present day on Earth when carbon dioxide levels have been 20 times higher than today's levels. So these parts per million that they talk about now as there's some sort of geologically unprecedented in Al Gore, and I'll show you some charts here in a minute, which will give you an idea. This is Al Gore. This is from Al Gore's film. We featured this in Climate Hustle, the first film. And you see there, that's the scene at the, at the scene where it says present Al Gore's high point. When Al Gore gets on that little elevator and tries to show you how many parts per million in the atmosphere CO2 is, he's trying to scare us. But if he had been intellectually and scientifically and geologically uh, uh, honest, he would have shown you the uh, time before present in millions of years and shown you that the current levels of CO2 in our atmosphere are nothing when it comes to the Earth's geologic history. In fact, 90% of Earth's geologic history uh, has had higher CO2 levels in today and warmer temperatures. 90% of Earth's geologic history roughly have been too warm to have ice at either pole. This is the kind of stuff Al Gore left out. Interesting, you can still find some interesting charts on U.S. government data. This is a NOAA chart still available on the NOAA website. Features a temperature chart showing Earth's history much hotter than today. And look at that, past temperatures much too warm for ice sheets or perennial ice sheets, or perennial sea ice. 
and you can see where the today uh, temperatures are much, much lower than much of the past uh, you know, 500 million years. And this is according to a NOAA chart, which is fascinating that you, know, you don't see this in Leonardo DiCaprio and Al Gore. You don't see this in John Holdren talks. You don't see Justin Trudeau talking about the geologic history of the earth using government data and charts like this. Patrick Moore, the great Canadian former co-founder of Greenpeace who left the organization. This is a great chart that just shows you how slight the temperature increase has been since about 1880. It's just if you actually showed it without showing the tenths, hundreds of a degree, when they come up with the hottest year, the hottest year on record, it's usually within the margin of error of the data set. And this is a great chart to show you that, how, how steady the temperature has actually been. One of my favorite quotes to give for, is the UK scientist Philip Stott, who I've interviewed many times and met. Climate change is governed by hundreds of factors or variables. The idea that we can manage it predictably by understanding and manipulating at the margins. One politically selected factor, CO2, is as misguided as it gets. It's scientific nonsense. And of course, Stott was featured in Climate Hustle 2 saying this. And I think that's probably the simplest explanation of it. And even the scientists at Real Climate Science, uh, uh, realscience.org, uh, which was done by Gavin Schmidt, Michael Mann, they actually had a post back in 2007, almost verbatim to this, admitting that the emergent temperature is hundreds of factors. So it's a very hard stretch for them to claim that CO2 is the control knob of the climate. This is another way I think the general public can understand. Imagine, if you will, a world where people believe the temperature of the planet can be controlled by giving the government more money. Now, Rod Serling of the Twilight Zone never actually said it, so there, this is a, a joke. However, he could have said it. It's about as illogical as anything that anyone could say, as illogical as anyone could say, and as much science fiction as anyone could say. But that's what the United Nations wants us to believe. The United Nations actually basically is saying, pay up or the climate will get you. 97%, one of the claims, one of the studies found only 77 anonymous scientists. Uh, they had whittled it down from over 10,000. 97% wasn't even 97 scientists. Another 97% scientist uh, by an Australian scientist was debunked by UN IPCC lead author Richard Toll. 97% claim is essentially pulled from thin air, not based on any credible research. Yet this is one of the hallmarks of environmental activists, of the news media, of politicians, all claiming this famed non-existent 97% consensus. This is interesting. This is the new UN report I just mentioned. Almost out of time, stark warning from scientists on disaster. Uh, this is hilarious because we've been hearing about the end of time forever. The UN's 50 years of eco-doom warnings. UN Environmental Protection, we have 10 years to stop the, the uh, uh, catastrophe in 1972. 1982, uh, they warned of a catastrophe. 1989, they warned of the 10-year tipping point on climate, a UN official. So this just keeps coming. Some of the famous climate predictions, 1970, Paul Ehrlich, between 1980 and 1989, 4 billion people, including 65 million Americans, would perish in the great die-off. I don't know about you, but we survived the great die-off. Al Gore has said humans have only 10 years left to save the planet from turning into a frying pan. He said that when his first film came out in 2006. The world is going to end in 12 years is the most recent. My favorite, of course, was Prince Charles, who predicted the 100-month tipping point, and he actually counted down the months. But once the 100 months expired, what do you think old Prince Charles did? He gave a new tipping point up into almost like 2048 or something. They just keep erasing the deadline and giving it a new one. By the way, in my book, Green Fraud, I go back to 1864 was the first climate tipping point that I could research and find. And it warned of climatic excess unless we changed our ways. So the first climate tipping point, 1864. The UN IPCC is purely a political body posing as a scientific institution. This is a UK professor, John Brignell. I think that's probably the best explanation for the UN climate panel. Because think about the UN climate panel. It was formed in 1988. First report came out in 1990. It, it has put itself in charge of hyping CO2 as the control knob and danger to climate. If the United Nations Climate Panel fails to find CO2 as a problem, they fail to have a reason not only to exist, but also a reason for the United Nations to then be in charge of the solution, which they themselves keep finding, of the problem that they keep finding. So this is the self-interested lobbying organization known as the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate. 
The 2020 UN report, which came out in early August of 2021, seeks directly and nakedly to, to lobby you. The IPCC author, Jim Cosin, uh, sells extreme model scenarios. He actually says his stated goal is, this is a lead author of this UN report. I think people more and more are starting to get scared, he said. The climate service was among the IPC authors on the extreme chapter. He's selling a service, a climate risk firm. But his quote here is, I think they'll help to change people's attitude, the new climate report, and hopefully it'll affect the way they vote. So let's get this straight. The UN report is designed specifically to affect the way you vote. Thinking of not voting or supporting Justin Trudeau because you know you don't like his climate policy, well, read the UN report. That ought to scare the hell out of you. You'll support every politician who wants to do something about climate if you read it. That's the stated goal of the United Nations Climate Report. Richard Lindsay, former MIT scientist, controlling carbon is a bureaucrat's dream. If you can control carbon, you can control life. Profound comment, and it's absolutely true. Dr. Admar Eatenhofer, the UN IPCC chair, former chair, we, the UN IPCC, redistribute de facto the world's wealth by climate policy. And this, if you had any illusions that the UN was an environmental or climate organization, the climate panel, one has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. Uh, thank you, UN, for admitting that. So. Let's go through some of the science here. Is the science of climate change really settled? We keep hearing everyone talk about the settled science. Our climate envoy, John Kerry, Joe Biden, Justin Trudeau, European leaders, Boris the settled science, it's all settled. There's no debate anymore. Let's take a look at the state of climate science in 2021. First of all, the New York Times has claimed that a cooler earth produces climate stability and a carbon tax would result in, in more climate stability. So a cooler earth is climate stability, but the same New York Times in 1976 warned that a warmer earth produces climate stability. Cool periods produce greater climate uh, instability, they claimed. So which is it? Warm periods produce stability or cool periods? It depends on what political agenda they're pushing and what decade you happen to be in. Trees both cause and stop climate change. This is fascinating because there's a big movement here in the United States. Republicans are trying to push tree planting as their low-tech solution, to the, the alternative to the Green New Deal. Planting a trillion trees could be the most effective solution. Why planting trees could make climate change and global warming worse. Take your pick. Trees either destroy the climate or they help the climate. Settled science. I'm sure you've heard this one. Mountains. Uh, that everywhere you look on the world, wherever they want to do a profile on climate change, it always ends up warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. We always typically hear it about the Arctic or the Antarctic. But look at this. Everywhere on the planet, whether it's Canada warming twice as weight, Spain is warming, Australia is heating up twice as fast, Sweden is heating up, the Adirondacks. It's amazing. Everywhere you go on the planet, everyone seems to be heating up twice as fast as average. It kind of makes you wonder how they come up with the average. So the state of climate change science, predict both outcomes and you're always right. Let's go, let's take a look at the state of science in 2021. Climate change causes less rain. Climate change causes more rain, but less water. Climate change means less snow. Oh, snow's a thing of the past, how about that? But wait a minute, climate change means more snow. Global warming means more snowstorms, what? Climate change causes Antarctica to lose land ice. Climate change causes Antarctica to gain land ice. Climate change causes duller autumn leaves, but wait, climate change causes more colorful autumn leaves. Wait a minute, duller, more colorful, which is it? Climate change makes for saltier seas, but climate change makes for less salty seas. It's so confusing. Climate change increases the spread of malaria, but climate change decreases the spread of malaria. I'm confused. Climate change causes dengue fever outbreaks to increase, but climate change also could decrease dengue fever outbreaks. outbreaks. The U.S. will see 50% more lightning strikes, thanks to global warming. More lightning, but less lightning. Lightning strikes could drop by 15% because of global warming. This is so confusing. Climate change makes San Francisco foggier. Climate change makes San Francisco less foggy. Climate change causes more hurricanes, except when climate change causes less hurricanes. Climate change will both increase and decrease fertility. Okay, they're, they're just giving up now. This is the Philadelphia Inquirer from earlier this year. A growing body of studies suggests climate change could have impacts on fertility, both increasing and decreasing. And I think they've just given up. Now they're just admitting straight out, climate change will do it all. Don't worry about it. If you predict both teams to win the Super Bowl, 
uh, or a big sporting event. And, and no matter what happens, you can say, I predicted it. That's where we are now with climate. Are beavers good or bad? Beavers may be making the effects of climate change worse. But wait a minute. Beaver are humanity's natural allies in fighting climate change. Which is it? Mammals shrink when the earth heats up. Horses will be the size of cats? Oh my gosh, this is very concerning. But wait, climate change is making horses fat as it's causing an abundance of grass to grow. So we're going to have horses shrinking to the size of cats, but they're going to be real fat. So we're going to have fat cat horses, I guess. I don't know. I, I can't follow the science. I don't have a PhD in climatology. How do you expect me to do it? Coronavirus prompts record drop in global emissions. But wait, CO2 hits new record despite COVID-19 lockdowns. How is that possible? I don't know. It's the magic of, of, of COVID-19. It can cause you know, record de decreases in emissions and somehow record increases. Global warming causes more crime. Okay, this is the Los Angeles Times. So how is that possible? Climate change will become one of the major forces driving crime as the century progresses. So do you got that? Global warming causes crime. But according to the New York Times, lowering crime causes more global warming. How is that possible? Well, let's take a look. The New York Times explains inmates generally consume less than the average citizen in the country. So fewer prisoners might mean higher overall energy consumption. So get that? Fewer prisoners mean higher overall energy consumption because when you're in jail, you have a smaller carbon footprint. Now think about that. Think about that now in the context of lockdowns and how, how governments love lockdowns. It treats us all like inmates and we have lower carbon footprints. So global warming causes more crime. Reducing crime causes more global warming. And guess what the solution is? Defunding the police is now a climate solution. This is, this is a new one, but that's not the only one. There's no Green New Deal without police abolition. Who would have thought that you had to abolish the police in order to solve climate change or defund them? This is a, it's just, it's, a, it's an amazing world of climate science. You can't question. Don't challenge the science. If you disagree with any of this, you're a climate denier who belongs in jail. And uh, by the way, uh, both Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Bill Nye have no problem sending climate deniers to jail. Both have publicly advocated for it. So climate goes woke. I mentioned this. I have a whole chapter in Green Fraud on how climate change has gone with the whole woke. And I'm not talking about just the climate solutions, like I mentioned, defunding the police or abolishing the police. I'm talking about uh, the science itself has been corrupted by the woke ideology. So what if toxic masculinity is the reason for climate change? This is the now legitimate questions in climate science we have to ask ourselves. NASA's, NASA, the once vaunted space agency, is now has their lead climate scientist, one of them named Dr. Kate Marvel, linking climate change to white supremacy. Quote, we'll never head off the climate catastrophe without dismantling white supremacy. And they're calling for climate and racial justice. This is a NASA climate scientist. Again, unless you have a PhD in climatology, you can't challenge this science. This is peer reviewed stuff here. Well, maybe not. Cancel your pets. Are our pets gobbling up the planet? Reducing the rate of dog and cat ownerships in favor of other pets. Uh, emotional benefits will be considerably reduce these impacts. And I, one of the pets they recommend, of course, is hamsters. So get rid of your dog and cat. Get a hamster if you care about their children and the earth at all. But of course, you can't really care about your children. Why? Because you shouldn't be having children. Is having a baby in 2021 pure environmental vandalism? Ask yourselves out there, how many of you have engaged in pure environmental vandalism? If you have, you have no business uh, challenging any of this climate sciences. Now, climate change may require elimination of car ownership. Our current car ownership and usage model is inefficient. This is Andrew Yang ran for the Democratic. He's proposing instead of private car ownership, a constant roving fleet of electric rental cars that you could just order up whenever you want. Hey, that sounds great. Let's get some rental electric cars and let's get rid of our cars. We don't need that. In Canada recently, there were calls to abolish private pickup ownership and make pickup trucks only available when you need them. In other words, you'd rent them for a few hours, haul some stuff, but otherwise pickup trucks are not going to be allowed in a declared climate emergency. So we have redefined the evidence for climate change. No longer do we look at 
Te global temperature, polar bears, sea level. It makes Al Gore seem so quaint when his first movie came out. Al Gore, for all his faults, actually looked at the climate science uh, measures and, and actual in traditional indicators. Now, you want to know how global warming's faring? We look at airline turbulence, rape statistics, crime statistics, vehicle theft, train derailments, police shootings, toxic masculinity, white supremacy, car accidents. These are the new ways they measure climate change. Uh, it's just very hard to keep up. Very, very hard. Okay, so here's the problem, and this is why the Green New Deal is worse than you think. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the Green New Deal as well here a little later on. But climate lockdowns. Is this the solution that environmentalists want? Is this the future that they want? And I think the answer is a resounding yes, uh, because that's their phrase. That's not my phrase. Climate lockdowns was a phrase employed by a Soros Gates funded uh, professor in a, one of their publications. They use the phrase climate lockdown. Climate morphs to COVID reset. Now this is MIT scientist Richard Lindzen said something very interesting in 2009. It's hard to imagine a better leverage point than carbon dioxide to assume control over a society. It's essential to the production of energy. It's essential to breathing. If you demonize CO2 and gain control over it, you, so to speak, control everything. So it has a kind of fundamental attractiveness to a bureaucratic mentality. Perfectly said of the entire climate change debate. But look what he said. It's hard to imagine a better leverage point than carbon dioxide to control society. Well, fast forward to 2020, and they imagined it. They imagined that better leverage point in order to control society. The COVID climate reset connection. And coronavirus, COVID-19, is mutating. And you can see what it's mutating into. It's the hammer and sickle. It's the Chinese Communist Party. It's mutating into the greatest threat to liberty that humans have faced as general-wide population in many, many decades. This is the Washington Post. We're flattening the coronavirus curve. We can flatten the climate curve too. Sure, why not? Two weeks to, to essentially introduce us all to tyranny and, uh, and, uh, and liberty crushing endless permanent lockdowns. If we can shut the world down to stop a virus, it also means it's possible to do the same for climate change. This is teen climate activist uh, Jamie Margolin in Teen Magazine. She's testified on climate in front of the US Congress. That's what she believes, is that we can do the same thing for climate change. John Kerry has said, I don't say this in a partisan way, but the parallels between COVID-19 and climate change are screaming at us, both positive and negative. You could just as easily replace the words climate with COVID-19. The Great Reset. Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum chairman, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. He has quite literally called for a great reset of capitalism due to the pandemic. And the World Economic Forum is poised. This is, a, this is an e economic group that includes everyone from Bill Gates to, to Al Gore to Prince Charles, every U.S. president, including Donald Trump, Joe Biden. Go, go, go to these meetings. This is a hugely influential group. And they are behind this. They know that it's time to seize the opportunity to make what we've seen with this COVID-19 lockdowns uh, society-wide continue indefinitely. Net zero, like lockdown, but permanent. So you have zero COVID, you have net zero CO2. These are some of the frightening things that are emerging in the last few years. Time Magazine, uh, the pandemic remade every corner of society. Now it's climate's turn. Now think about that. They're praising the impacts of lockdowns, largest transfer of wealth from poor middle class to the wealthy. The corporate uh, world has largely gone unscathed or benefited greatly. The small mom and pops crushed. The pandemic lockdown certainly remade every corner of society. Now it's climate's turn? This is nuts. Climate lockdowns, the equivalent of COVID emissions drop needed every two years. This is according to UK Guardian from March of 2021. So imagine if you love the lockdowns and the, and the, emissions, the emissions drop, I think it was about a 7% drop in global emissions uh, year to year. Uh, that we experienced because of the huge lockdown. Keep in mind, every UN summit I've been to has called for the degrowth movement, planned recessions in order to fight global warming. So this is pretty scary that they're going to use a lockdown as the same way that they've been trying to use the, the planned recessions to fight global warming. Here's something eerie. 2012, uh, Ivo de Boer, the former head of the UN climate, Shutting down the whole economy is the only way of limiting global warming to 2C. So it gives you an idea. The lockdowns really were uh, excitement to progressives and the climate activists because they saw it as the way to, quote, solve global warming. 
Senator Chuck Schumer in the Washington, D.C. Uh, U.S. Senate uh, Majority Leader urges Joe Biden to declare a climate emergency. Now, think about that. A climate emergency is declared, much like the viral emergency is declared. You can start suspending all sorts of uh, 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 civil liberties and normal ways that you would vote in uh, legislators and parliament. It's a pretty scary concept. This is the uh, International Energy Agency report, which came out this year. They called a net zero report, urged behavioral changes to fight climate change. And guess what they were calling for? A shift away from private car use, upper speed limits, thermostat control, limits on hot water, uh, you know, limiting all sorts of things very similar to a COVID lockdown where you're going to be sort of locked in your home, you know, restrictions on travel. A UK funded 2019 report called Absolute Zero urged the form of climate lockdowns. Stop flying, no new roads, airport closures, stop eating beef, lamb, stop doing anything that causes emissions, regulate CO2 similar to asbestos. Now think about that. If you're going to consider carbon dioxide uh, like something like asbestos, how is that not treating it like it's a deadly virus? They're, they want to do exactly a, a morph from COVID lockdowns to climate lockdowns. On the same path, just in September of 2021, new CO2 monitoring credit card enables tracking of your carbon footprint on every purchase. Monitors and cuts off spending when we hit our carbon max. MasterCard and the United Nations join forces. Hey, how about that? Corporate America joining up with government and quasi-government organizations to suppress us and control us and regulate us. The World Economic Forum could not be more happy about this credit card. Uh, many of us are aware to, to reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, this card will monitor and cut off spending when you hit your carbon max. How about that? You're going to have a little MasterCard in corporate America be monitoring your carbon footprint and stopping you from spending when you hit your limit. That's, that's our future if we allow it. Climate death tolls. Now, we all know about the COVID death tolls on nightly news and cable news. Climate change is a killer, but we don't acknowledge it on death certificates, said uh, Dr. Hunter from Australia National University. There was a second component of death certificate which allows for pre-existing conditions. They want to add climate change as a cause of death now to, to death certificates. Now think about that. Death certificate, cause of death, climate change. Don't, th this is not far-fetched. Bill Gates has said last year, the economic death toll from climate change will be much, much greater than what we have with COVID-19. So Bill Gates is all in on this. But here's the problem. The federal government under President Obama has, asked, has said that global warming will cause more deadly car crashes. The American Cancer Society said cancer is already, climate change is already increasing the cancer risk, and they fretted over the carbon footprint of cancer care. Now, first of all, imagine having a cancer doctor who was worried about the carbon footprint of your cancer care. Wouldn't you uh, deep six that doctor as fast as you could? But this is what's happening. So, you, so ca cancer death could be a climate death. Al Gore's new health warming. Every organ system can be affected by climate change. So if you die from cancer, a car accident, or organ failure, you could be listed as a climate change death toll. You must follow the science. Do not be a science denier. But the reality destroys this claim. After 100 years of climate change related, climate change related deaths now approach zero, a 99% drop since 1920. So if you're actually worried about climate change being a killer, all you'd have to do is look at the data and realize we've taken an unsafe climate with our energy, fossil fuels, and made it safe. 99% drop in climate related death risk from 2020, from 1920 to 2020. But that's not going to stop the media. Just you could imagine it now crossing out the word coronavirus or COVID and putting in climate change everywhere it's possible. That, of course, is a CNN mock up. That's not hasn't happened just yet on CNN. So USA is the number one climate killer. So America's always liked to be number one. So I guess the UK Guardian has announced it. Three Americans create enough carbon to kill one person, study finds. We're murdering people. But luckily, that new MasterCard teamed up with the UN. We can start saving lives by having no, no purchasing power once we hit our CO2 limit. And there's another example of uh, CNN with their climate change death toll potentially coming up. I write about all this in my next book coming out in February of 2022, The Great Reset, 
global elites and the permanent lockdown. I go in great detail how the idea of, of uh, COVID-19 lockdowns have prepared everyone around the world to have governments, unelected governments and health bureaucrats, tell us uh, how many people can be at a backyard barbecue, have people, your neighbors rat you out if you have too many, how you can't go to weddings, funerals, unless a government bureaucrat signs off, how you have curfews, stay at home orders, only essential services, um, limitations on your travel. It has been the most amazing thing to watch. I go through this and I explain there's two huge chapters on climate in this new book and this COVID climate lockdown. Um, and it's an amazing thing because this is what the progressive left has waited for for decades. Jane Fonda's own words were COVID is God's gift to the left. They've waited for something to exploit. And that's what the lockdowns have given them, something they never thought they would ever, ever have. Um, and it's amazing. So my book, Green Fraud, which came out in March of this year, uh, goes through great detail. Again, I mentioned I have, uh, I mentioned that the European issue, and as they're going through record high energy prices right now. But one of the things that's really creepy about this is it's part of the plan of the Green New Deal authors. The era of constant electricity at home is ending, says the UK power chiefs. Families would have to get used to power only when it's available. And in 1976, John Holdren lamented the same thing, or actually he lamented that Americans could go to the store, buy a six pack of beer and drive home. They don't want people free. The idea that people can actually have a, a, a cheap, reliable energy means that the planet can't take it in a progressive view, means that, that people left to their own devices uh, will destroy the earth, create inequity, and we need to have our lives micromanaged by essentially unelected bureaucrats of the administrative state. And that's what's very scary about this. So the era of constant electricity has got to be one of those casualties. Coming to America, climate regs equal human suffering. Right now in the UK, uh, homes are, are in the future have to meet climate targets. Radiators will have to be 10 degrees cooler for Britain to reach it. So they're going to make old people in the winter suffer through much more brutal cold. Cold kills many more times than heat. This is our future. They want to create a society of crisis, of energy rationing, of shortages, because that empowers politicians. It empowers a crisis state. It empowers an administrative state. It empowers guaranteed annual incomes. It empowers a welfare state, which then empowers the politicians in charge to have more power. This is part of the COVID climate agenda. Roger Pilker Jr. Uh, pointed out this is uh, 81 million acres of, are being used for energy in the U.S. We may need four times that acreage to, in order to meet our green goals. And you can just see how much energy, how much uh, space it takes to produce any equivalent amount of you know, wind or solar energy from fossil fuels. It's just not efficient. It's not ready to take over from 80% from of global energy fossil fuels. And you can go back 100 years 80% of energy was from fossil fuels, but they're going for it. They're going to try. It's going to be the. It's going to be a devastating impact on the world in the next decade. And I don't see. I don't feel like it's going to be stopped. I feel like the momentum is there for this whole green agenda. Energy dominance under our President Trump here in the United States. The United States returned to a position of energy dominance for the first time since the 1950s. When Harry Truman was president, energy production exceeded energy consumption and uh, energy exports exceeded energy imports. This was happened in 2019 under President Trump. So Joe Biden comes in and what does he do? He's now begging OPEC to, uh, to increase oil production. Um, Russian oil, um, uh, oil imports are at an 11 year high in the United States. Our solar, wind, and electric car mandates are going to mean more reliance on Chinese mining. This is the most unbelievable thing. Climate change is not a national security threat. Climate policy is the greatest national security threat. So here's a little example of climate futility. This is the United Nations uh, going back to the Rio Earth Treaty. It's got Kyoto on here. It's got Copenhagen. It's got Paris. And every UN meeting that they had, they always declare this great success, particularly Paris, where it'll be the, mem uh, the, the, the meeting that all of our grandchildren will remember, that our kids are going to be happy. John Kerry brought his granddaughter in to sign it. Everyone was praising it as though we had saved the planet. And look what happened. CO2 emissions just continue to go up regardless of how successful these United Nations climate treaties claim to be. It's just called a climate of futility. 
UN Climate Chief Christina Figueres has praised China for, quote, doing it right on global warming. And China's political system avoids the legislative hurdles in some countries, including the U.S., according to the UN, former UN Climate Chief. Think about that. As we in the United States, Canada, other places go for these COVID uh, vaccine mandates, this is straight out of the Chinese um, uh, social credit system. So you have New York Times columnist Tom Friedman in the pages of the New York Times praising China's one-party rule as well. The reason the progressives love the lockdown rules so much and they don't want to get rid of these permanent lockdowns is because they can finally impose the one-party state in America that they've admired so long from China. That is an amazing thing. Because right now, we have, uh, Americans have no say, Canadians have no say, as the unelected bureaucracy starts imposing these uh, new mandates upon us in a Chinese-style way. We already have in the United States uh, people like General Flynn, uh, former President Trump's national security advisor, who was had his visa card revoked because the visa didn't like his politics. We've had Candace Owen denied COVID tests because she didn't support COVID lockdowns. A local health uh, official didn't want to give her the test because they didn't like her politics. We have countries that are denying banking to people uh, if, unless they get the vaccine, uh, you know, go along with the vaccine mandate. So this is where we are. This is very Chinese style Communist Party. This is why the left loves it. They've done nothing but praise the communist Chinese style social credit system and one party rule. And now they get to revel in it and be in charge of it here in the once free West. <clears throat> China puts growth ahead of climate will surge with surge in coal powered steel mills. So China is building about one coal power plant a week. Uh, and this is just an amazing thing because China is seen as this great champion of climate by the left. The U.S. Green New Deal, no impact. Uh, using U.N. science, Green New Deal temperatures impact would be barely distinguishable from zero, according to a 2019 study. So if we actually faced a climate emergency, you would do the opposite of what the Green New Deal uh, has called for. None of the strategies that have been offered by the UN, U.S. government or by the EPA or anybody else have the remotest chance of altering the climate if, in fact, climate is controlled by carbon dioxide. That's Robert Giegengack, a geologist who actually was a big fan of Al Gore, went and saw his first film and was horrified at it. But that's what the key here to remember is if we did face a climate catastrophe, you'd want to do the opposite of what the UN Green New Deal and the Green Agenda is proposing. You would want to unleash economic growth, technology, innovation, and you would want to challenge it. But this is just bonkers and backwards. So with that, I'm looking forward to the Q&A here tonight. Uh, my organization's Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. My website's Climate Depot. That's how you can reach me, Morano at Climate Depot. Uh, and the film is Climate Hustle. You can go to climatehustle.com and you can actually watch the first and second film. So I want to thank you for watching. Thank Friends of Science here. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A coming up. Thank you very much. This is Mark Morano signing off. Well, that was quite the presentation. Uh, the first part was very funny, almost a climate comedy, and the second part was actually staggering in the intensity of the implications of the Green New Deal and these many plans that the climate activists have for us. So I'd like to now bring Mark Morano in live from the States and we can talk with him about his uh, presentation and about his book. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michelle. I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Friends of Science, for this opportunity to talk to you guys. Looking forward to it. I have to say, my head is spinning. I can't believe how far these people are willing to go. Yeah, what's really happened here is they've spent decades in the environmental movement going back to Paul Ehrlich's overpopulation trying to scare everyone. I have a whole chapter, Global Cooling in the 1970s, uh, on how it was all the same solutions, the same claims, tipping points, you know, oh, bad weather, extreme weather is caused by global cooling. The New York Times said stability would be improved with a warmer climate. Now they say it'd be uh, opposite. But 
What happened was they spent all those decades. Gallup polling even showed that climate was not scaring anyone in terms of that. You know, going back to 1988, there was really not that. There was always fluctuations, but it never really changed. Climate was always 19 or 20 on a list of 20 priorities. COVID came along. As I said, it gave them the dream that they've been advocating for decades. The praise of China, one party state, became reality in the once free West. So COVID was a game changer. And now they can just, they want to declare a climate emergency, restrict our travel, restrict our energy, go after our diets, do whatever they want because an emergency, don't you know? And they're going to be able to do it. So (laughs) this is why we are just, we are in for a very rough time. And in Canada, it's probably, actually, I think it's much worse in Canada than it is for the United States right now, uh, just in terms of the COVID restrictions, climate restrictions. You know, your premier, Justin Trudeau, is a, you know, a true fascist. I don't know what else to say. He's a true apostle of the Chinese uh, uh, Chinese state. Well, I found that very alarming that that one IPCC author that you referred to was actually lobbying uh, basically the public. And we were in an election period, uh, which I wonder if he was registered as a third party uh, election <laughs> official. I found it also quite interesting how many no's there are in the world of climate activists, like no kids, no car, no beef, no fun, uh, no pets, no, and trees are good and bad. So it's, yeah. uh, it's a really mad, mad world. It's, again, I, I use the code lockdowns. You are only able to do what the state says you can do that day, that moment. In the case of like Australia, they have something called snap lockdowns. And they're talking about keeping this going forward where you wake up, you think, okay, this is gonna be a day I can go out, I can go to this. Nope, if some unelected, unelected keyword, health bureaucrat in Australia declares that, oh, there's too many cases today. Uh, or, you know, so therefore we have a snap lockdown. It can be imposed immediately depending on region, which will have your tracking app that'll keep you monitor where you go. If you go out without a mask, you can be arrested. If you go to the beach, you have the military come in with helicopter. This is nuts. I mean, yeah. nuts, nuts, nuts. Uh, and, and this is happening. You know, Australia is probably the most extreme example with the zero COVID philosophy. There's now talk that they might be loosening that. But again, you cannot separate COVID and climate because for decades, the advocates of climate change wanted the exact same things as what we saw when COVID hit all the same policies. And now they started out being jealous. Now they're excited because they want to morph this. And remember, it wasn't climate skeptics like myself or you or anyone else who said COVID lockdowns. This originally came from, from a Gates Soros funded professor, Mariana Marcuse, if I'm saying mm-hmm. her name right, in the UK. This is They came up with it and said, we're going to need uh, the switch from COVID lockdowns to climate lockdowns. So and I tried, if you notice in the presentation, I'm citing as mainstream of sources as I possibly can. Vogue magazine, New York Times, Washington Post, Energy Information Agency. I mean, these are like the organs of the establishment. I'm not I'm citing an obscure blog here and obscure. This is some, I like to say 2020 was the year of conspiracy uh, reality <laughs> outnumbered conspiracy theories. And you just look to the establishment and what they're saying. Yes, well, on that point about Australia, you know, they, if I recall correctly, Australia was blamed for COP25 not reaching agreement on Article 6, and the Australians also kicked the carbon ca- tax to the curb. So, I'm, you know, is this climate retribution being imposed upon them? I mean, we know there is a connection between the climate and the COVID world. Yeah, well, first of all, Australia has got different states. And some states are more severe. Some states are, you know, more less severe with all these restrictions, number one. And number two, I don't, it's a, I'm still just struggling to figure out what's going on in Australia. I know that even their conservative or their, you know, their right wing, whatever you want to call it, leaders have always paid lip service and they've gone back and forth. But yes, they were instrumental in helping torpedo. And I was at that UN climate summit uh-huh. in Madrid. That was 2019, the last one. Uh, but yes, it could be some sort of resolution. I don't know that they're thinking. I think they're just, I think this whole thing has always been about power and about imposing 
their world, the progressive worldview, without actually selling it on the merits. So they use the overpopulation scare, the global cooling scare, the Amazon scare, the climate change scare, and COVID's the only one that really struck gold for them, as Jane Fonda said, God's gift to the left. So I Maybe. think they're just gonna they're gonna deceive on it. So I don't know that Australia was actually you know, being punished, I think it's just everything was in place to seize on this opportunity. They're not going to let COVID get away and they're not going to let COVID fade away. They're going to morph it to climate with every power that they have. That's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question here coming in from our viewing audience. Uh, the first one is, how do we fight back against these lockdowns? <sighs> You know, I, I, I like to joke, it's time to gouge our eyes out and give up. No, um, you know, this is something, I mean, the only way, and I, I, I mean, I'm, I'll announce this on live, uh, I would say TV, but I guess live broadcast. I chose not to get the COVID vaccine, the jab, whatever you want to call it. For one, the main reason being, I'm choosing to be a political dissident. I want to defy. I want to go to New York City. I want to harass restaurants. I want to walk into them, sit down, make them come over and tell me they won't serve me if I don't have it. So I think mass defiance is our only true hope. We can't necessarily elect some politician who's going to reverse it for us. I like to use the example of East Germany, uh, the old East Germany, which collapsed in 1989. The Berlin Wall came down. The East German you know, government, parliament didn't vote to say, okay, the people have been in prison for 40 some odd years under Soviet domination. Let's get them their freedom. The Berlin Wall came down in East Germany because people no longer gave their consent to tyranny. So what we need to see is what we're seeing in Australia, mass protests, police fighting the protesters, mass storming of the streets, the parliament. I mean, this is what you absolutely need, mass defiance, mass defiance, mass defiance. I always like to say New York City is our greatest uh, challenge right now because it, I have to do it to the song, a Frank Sinatra's famous song, New York, New York. If it can happen in New York, it can happen anywhere. If they get away with these vaccine passports, they can get away with anything, COVID-related, climate-related. New York City's got to fight back. I got a lot of flack from my own side by saying I fully support Black Lives Matter fighting the covid uh, vaccine mandates in New York City. We're up to almost 70% of the residents of African-Americans don't have a vaccine. So what New York City is basically doing is bringing in segregation. Blacks disproportionately aren't allowed to go to Broadway shows, theaters, restaurants, movies, aren't allowed to participate in New York's rich cultural life. I applaud Black Lives Matter for doing it, not because I like Black Lives Matter, not because I don't recognize that they you know, help destroy American cities or that they're Marxists, but I know an organization like that can be a massive disrupting force. And hell, they already destroyed New York City the year before, why not destroy New York City's vaccine mandate? So I'm cheering them on. If you ask me what you can do, I think you actually have to make alliances with groups you never would have thought possible. Here's another shocker, Michelle, and I'm sorry to filibuster here, but I did work in the Senate. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., to my face during an interview in 2014, told me that he thought climate skeptics belong at The Hague with all the other war criminals with three square meals in a cot. I now have publicly forgiven Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for saying that as a climate skeptic. I don't care. I'm willing to work with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for one reason. He has been phenomenal fighting the mask mandates, the vaccine mandates, the COVID lockdowns. I believe this whole political spectrum is changed. It's no longer left, right. It's either pro-tyranny or, 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 or anti-tyranny. And I'm willing to align with the Bill Mars of the world, the politically left comedian. I'm willing to align with Naomi Wolf, who I've met and talked to, form an alliance. I believe that this is how we defeat it. We have to throw out and throw out the old dead. So that's why I'm supporting Black Lives Matter's efforts in New York City to fight that. That's why I'm, I've forgiven and I'm willing to work and support wholeheartedly Robert F. Kennedy Jr. when it comes to COVID, even though we still disagree on climate. Okay, if we can have open civil debate on climate, that would be a start. And we should have the yeah. same on the COVID issues. But uh, I have a question here from uh, Randy. Mark, are you optimistic that the majority will wake up and put an end to this nonsense? Or are we truly doomed? <laughs> well, we're never doomed as long as there's defiance. I don't, you know, I go through waves. Sometimes I just think this has been going on for decades. It's always 
the progressives are essentially always getting away. And here's an example. 1972 in America, George McGovern ran and got the Democratic nomination. He ran on a universe basic income, a, a guaranteed annual income. <laughs> Even his own Democratic opponents, including Hubert Humphrey, opposed this because of the cost, ideology, just America wasn't ready for it. He lost in a landslide, Richard Nixon, one of the largest in our presidential race in 1972. Fast forward, a, a guaranteed annual income is now actually becoming a reality. Even Donald Trump with the COVID relief and what's happened to Joe Biden, where people are getting paid more not to work. And now people with families and kids are being in. So this is so I think just think what it's done is it accelerates the march toward state control of our lives and administrative state. So am I optimistic? It depends on what day you get me. I don't know that we can evolve out of it. I think there's going to have to be some sort of civil disobedience, some sort of societal collapse and then to rebuild. I don't know that we can just say, oh, we're going to stop it. And yeah, we might for an election cycle like Donald Trump, you might for an election cycle somewhere in Europe. But I just don't know. This is so insidious. They own so much of the permanent bureaucracy, the unelected bureaucracy of government. That it almost doesn't matter who you elect. And it's very, very hard to fight. But as long as we're out there opposing tyranny and as long as there's mass defiance, as many people as possible defying these rules, be it the restrictions on travel, be it the restrictions you know, for vaccine mandates and all this in the two tier society, then we have hope and we have to keep fighting it. The more mass resistance we have, the more mass defiance, the greater chance we have of defeating it. OK, a different kind of question. Is it possible to mine enough lithium for batteries to replace fossil fuel transportation? Well, you know, I, that's great. I don't exactly know. I'm not a, a lithium, a peak lithium person on that. But I do know that China owns 90, provides 90% of the rare earth uh, metals used for solar, wind, electric car batteries. I, so I don't know that we will run out. It's kind of like in my book, Green Fraud, I show you, I think it was the yeah, U.S. Energy Information Agency in like 2006 or seven. They came out with their projections of where the, the energy mix would be 10, 10, 12 years down the road. They were spectacularly wrong. John Holdren in 1980 thought we'd run out of oil by, ni by 1990. He said, well, I have less than a decade left. We always find new ways to extract more energy, more mining, more oil, gas, coal. So, no, I don't think so. You might be able to say at some point, given current technologies, there's X amount, but even those statistics are always wrong. So I think the problem is we are going to be empowering China, who's building one coal plant a week, who's going to be providing all these rare earth minerals using slave labor by the, the Uyghurs in, in China, buying up Africa. There's allegations of all the child labor going on in the Congo for cobalt by China. And the big news, of course, is that Afghanistan, China is now made friends with the Taliban, met with them in person. They didn't meet with John Kerry on climate. They did it over video, <laughs> but they met with the Taliban to get access to all their rare, rare earth uh, metals and for yeah. their mining. And meanwhile, the Biden administration uh, and Europe is shutting down their any domestic energy. Biden killed the Peacestone pipeline. Biden is going after fracking, death of a thousand cuts, going after killing mining. And of course, his press secretary today, so I, I want to make sure I get the right quote, the exact quote, Certainly, we all want to keep gasoline prices low, but the threat of the climate crisis certainly can't wait any longer, unquote. That's the Biden administration's message. Not unlike the Obama, when they had their original energy secretary, Munoz, actually said, you know, we want European style gas prices in the United States. And he was forced to retract that. But the higher energy costs are something that the progressives know is necessary to create that chaos. Then the shortages come. It just gets all this big feedback loop. Yeah, it's a domino. And they get to subsidize people and get to buy votes. Yeah, you know, one of the problems when you compare the high gas prices in Europe to North America is that these are completely different geographical areas. Like there's a, a website called Map Fight. And anyone can go on there and compare countries. So if you compare, say, France and the United States, or France and Canada, it's astounding the difference, how vast the countries in North America are. And uh, I think climate activists don't understand this. I mean, 
We have a number of documents in Canada where climate activists have said, oh, well, a rise in gas prices in Denmark reduced driving by 10% or 20%. Well, Denmark is a postage stamp. And um, yes. I just think there's no place inland in Denmark where you're further than 58 kilometers from the sea. So, you know, that's not comparable to Canada <laughs> or the United States. I mean, we have to travel to simply survive, whether it be for work or shopping or whatever it may be. But having very high gas prices will literally kill people. I have other well, questions here. Well, I will be real brief on this. It's, it's yeah. beyond just the high gas prices. Transportation. They want to make vacations like they were 100 years ago, where only the wealthy could afford the seaside vacation. They're going after... Well, we have an activist named Eric Holtheis who said, in a declared climate emergency, you can only fly when it's morally justifiable, in quotes. That was the exact <laughs> phrase. And then you have all these reports calling for restrictions. They want to make flying, no travel. Bill Gates, guess who Bill Gates' model for lockdowns is? Australia. He said Europe and the United States should be following the lead of Australia and how to deal with COVID. At the same time, that means, and he also yeah, said the lockdowns need to keep going on longer. Meanwhile, he's putting in a bid for the world's largest private jet transport company. The uber wealthy <laughs> aren't going to be affected by any of these climate of or uh, uh, COVID restrictions. So we've got to wake up. I mean, I, I'm getting, I get, I'm so angry about this whole thing. I've watched basically us just slide into tyranny and it, 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 with a big jump in 2020. It's just in, incredible. And, you know, that's why even mask mandates, you have to fight because once they get the foothold, it just keeps going. Now, of course, they're masking our kids. The vaccine passports were seen as a fantasy by, in lockdowns were seen as a fantasy, even by Anthony Fauci. He actually said when China locked down, can you imagine, you know, San Francisco or New York doing that? It would never happen. But they, once they realized it could happen, they went all in. Sorry. Yeah. Well, and interesting, both COVID and climate lockdowns are based on faulty models. We have a video about that on our YouTube channel. But let's get to some of the questions from the audience. Um, so here's one. Why does the report by the Christian Science Monitor, and this is uh, referring to one of the slides in your show, I think, claim that more trees warm the planet? Is it because their dark color effect is greater than the CO2 absorption effect? Yes, I think it was northern forests, uh, the, tree, the CO2 it can increase global warming because it absorbs uh, the sunlight and creates heat. But it also depends. Like I remember when I did the Amazon rainforest documentary, you know, they said that the Amazon was the lungs of the earth. Well, if the trees are young and growing, they, they uh, you know, they take in more CO2. It depends on the tree cycles. Um, it's actually, you know, it's an, it's an incredible thing because Republicans here are trying to push that as this sort of settled science solution as an alternative to the Green New Deal. But see, trees can both cause both ends of it, both, you know, cooling and warming. I don't know the actual, you know, final outcome of trees are net or minus, but it just goes to show you that if you remove the politics, the science is never that settled. But the po politically, Republicans want it to just be as simple as trees uh, you know, are good and they'll save us. Kind of like I had the beaver slide in there. Beavers are our <laughs> ally. Beavers can make it worse, you know, reducing. It's just they can have it any way they want. Right. Well, we do have a video about the Trudeau tree planting uh, plan, which is very similar to what you state about the uh, United States plan to plant more trees and that will save I'm us. Not against um, and, yeah. um, as you were saying about trees, uh, like when they burn, they release a lot of carbon dioxide. So in the event that people are going into carbon um, sinks using old growth forests, like in Canada right now, Shell will squeeze a few more cents out of you. I think it's two cents a liter if you want to save the planet. Um, because then they will buy carbon offsets from the Dark Woods Project, yes. which is uh, managed and owned by the Nature Conservancy of Canada. So, you know, two cents a litre sounds like nothing until you figure out how many litres of gasoline are sold in Canada every year, and it's millions of dollars worth of money. But if that carbon sink goes up in smoke, the carbon dioxide emissions from it 
are right. massive. So who's going to pay that liability? You know, and we knew, know that there are not only pyromaniacs who, you know, have a mental disorder, but there are also arsonists who, um, you know, maybe from a foreign country who want to decimate your economy. And if your economy is relying on carbon credits in your forests, yes. well, good luck with that. So, uh, you know, that's something to think about. Um, there's another thing, yeah, another well. question here. We know that increasing CO2 will reduce the Arctic to tropics temperature gradient that powers storms. So why do some scientists think that warming will increase the intensity of storms? You know, that's incredible because as I mentioned in 1970s, they claimed that floods and droughts and, and other extreme weather was due to the global cooling. And that's a great question. I, you know, I've never quite understand because historically warming periods were climate optimums. They were mm -hmm. the times of, as the New York Times correctly said, the 1970s, climate stability. So if you look actually at the history of witchcraft, in my first book, Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change, I actually cite scholars, I think her name was Emily Oster, who studied and did all, did all this you know, uh, you know, profound historical work. Cold periods coincided with the largest outbreak of accusations of witchcraft and witch trials in Europe because yeah. of crop failures, extreme weather, and uh, the attendant um, you know, shortages of food. So it just it's, it never made any sense to me why they claim it. But of course, the answer, the real answer is that they can tune their climate models to be whatever they want. And if warming is what they're predicting, they can tune the models to show dire effects on extreme storms with you know runaway greenhouse effect into the future. By the way, a new study and I can't remember what publication, they're up to 2,500. They're saying that the year 2,500 using climate models is going to be an alien atmosphere fatal to humans. So <laughs> get ready, because in 400, is that 490 <laughs> years, we're going to be facing real doom. Yeah, but that's the IPCC, which also said that we can't forecast climates because it's a um, uh, dynamic, uh, chaotic non-linear system so we can't forecast what the future will be in terms of okay. climate um i have no, a couple of questions I have here to give this, well, a real quick shout out uh sure uh, uh, former harvard physicist lubos model today wins the prize for one of the, 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 the it's, it's my uh, headline the nobel prize committed suicide former harvard <laughs> physicist lubos model uh, RIPS award the U by, by the Nobel Committee to the uh, for climate models. They're giving out a Nobel Prize in physics. He now says the Nobel Prize in physics has become a joke. You're absolutely right, Michelle. The idea that the, the Nobel Prize in physics is going to climate modelers is an embarrassment. This is why we have people like Michael Mann, Michael Mann saying we have to wait, you know, for the things to happen to know if, they're, if it, we have to wait for the event to happen to know if the climate models were right. So, but that doesn't matter. The U, the Nobel Peace the Nobel, not Peace Prize, but the Nobel Physics Prize has already been issued now for climate models. It's a great read uh, to read his critique of it. It's devastating stuff. Well, I think Black also um, Freeman Dyson did an interview with Marijn Poels, the Dutch filmmaker. And in that interview, he talked about uh, Sikuru Manabi's computer models and their colleagues, their friends. And he said that from the beginning, Manabi had told him that uh, climate models are a very good tool for understanding climate, but they're a very poor tool for predicting climate. And um, yes. so, you know, I think that there probably has been a lot of very good research done with climate models and in understanding how Earth systems well, yes, work. But the problem is that these um, very theoretical and uh, as you pointed out, you know, you can tune them any way you want. So you add a little bit more salt or pepper, you know, to you know, change the flavor of your model and make it a little bit warmer um, so it, you can get the next grant. You know, this is a problem because these are now being used by policymakers as if they are some kind of tarot card fortune telling that this is what your future will be when, when in fact, that's completely not the case. And the IPCC already recognized that a long, long time ago. So 
A uh, couple of more questions here. Um, from Randy, would a major energy crisis like that which could hit Europe this winter help to derail this crazy climate COVID movement? Well, here's what's interesting. Funny he should say that. Tom Friedman, on the pages, the hollowed pages of the New York Times today, <laughs> their columnist, is now claiming, don't blame Greens for the looming energy disaster this winter in Europe. And the actual, the actual headline is, a scary energy winter is coming, don't blame the Greens. They know it's coming. They're already preemptively in the New York Times trying to say it's not going to be our fault when it's exactly their fault. We have the same thing happening you know, in the United States. It's happening in Europe. They've got the Russian pipeline coming in. They're going to be relying on uh, what you would call uh, hostile energy or hostile regimes for energy. Uh, and as I said, they're going to be getting used to the UK funded report came out in 2019. No more airports, you know, massive increases in right, energy. absolute this zero. Bandwidth, but they're afraid politically, uh, so they're so they're uh, now they're trying to uh, you know cover preemptively cover and not take the blame. Yeah, and if our viewers are not aware of what's going on over there, um, uh, England, Britain has built a lot of wind farms, and they've been highly reliant on wind for a pretty significant part of their energy, which sounds fantastic, because when it works, it's great. Um, and, but recently, there have been 35 days with virtually no wind whatsoever. Uh, and at the same time, um, the UK gets some of its power from Europe, and one of the big interconnect lines is uh, to French nuclear power. And nuclear plants have abundant energy, and they can provide for lots of countries. But there's a problem with that interconnect line. I think there's been a fire or something with it. So normally, you back up wind with natural gas. But they haven't kept significant gas reserves in England. And so they're out of gas, pretty much. They don't have the connection with uh, French nuclear, which was also a very significant backup that they had. And they don't have um, other options. They've had to turn one of their coal plants back on, uh, which is, uh, you know, something they didn't want to do, but thank God they were able to do it. And what's happened in the process as well, there have been a number of companies there that uh, produce carbon dioxide, the very thing that we're supposed to be taxing and that we're supposed to be hating. This carbon dioxide is essential for processing food. So these companies are saying, well, natural gas is too expensive now. We can't run our factory anymore, so we're not producing carbon dioxide. So the food processing industry is now saying, well, we can't process these kinds of food. So, you know, without carbon dioxide, we can't do it. And of course, energy prices are going up everywhere for everything, as you mentioned earlier. Thus, also transportation of food is being uh, affected and restricted. So it's just um, um, a wrecking well, ball. And not ball. to mention, natural gas prices are spiking worldwide, as is oil, gas, coal. So uh, it's going to be a really hard winter in Europe, but it's going to hit everyone everywhere because these are global commodities. So. Yes, I have a whole um, chapter that, about Europe's Green New Deal in my book. Uh huh. Yes, they're all in on the Green New Deal. Maybe not so much now. Um, so Fancy 2000 writes, with all the global warming agenda being told in the mainstream media and the critics being censored worldwide, how are the chances we can stop global warming mongers from destroying our freedom? Well, very similar theme to some of the other questions. Yes. But go ahead. I mean, you just I, I like to tell people you have to challenge the narrative and the premise. Uh, many, I know Europe years ago, even the opposition party, so to speak, didn't really want to challenge it. They just sort of wanted to say, oh, that's too expensive. Right. And yes, I'm all concerned about global warming. I mean, I hate to see that. And in the United States, many Republicans are following that. You know, we, I, I believe you have to challenge the narrative mm -hmm. and you have to go directly at the heart of it. And here's the bottom line. You don't, if you don't want to argue science, don't. Just go after cost benefit. Both, yes. I point out the UN, the Green New Deal, any proposal would not only would it not affect climate, it won't even affect global CO2 emissions. The only way you could ever affect global CO2 emissions is if China, India, South America, Asia, we're all in on it. But you have 100, 100 um, 
I'm sorry, one billion people without running water and electricity, and that, that you know they're not giving up. As the Indian uh, energy minister said, we're you know we have all these people without running water and electricity. We're not going to sign on to a CO2 limiting you know climate treaty. Now, the UN's getting around that with this hundred billion dollars slush fund of climate, which they're going to redirect, redistribute to the developing world. I'm going to the Scotland UN summit. Look, apparently they're waving the vaccine passport in Europe because they want all the developing world countries to come so they can dangle all the money so they'll support the next UN climate treaty. All the money they're going to get from the wealthy nations. The United States, I guess, leading the way, I think it's 90 some billion dollars that we're going to end up owing to this climate fund, which eventually is essentially is the United Nations paying poor country, rewarding countries in the developing world where people don't have running water, electricity, high infant mortality, short life expectancy. It's going to reward them for the countries that are best able to lock their people in longer term poverty. So in other words, if you can shut down your energy and keep your people poor, you're going to get a lot of funding from the UN. And that's not going to be to help the people. It's going to help the leaders. They're going to be able to build stadiums. They'll help themselves get reelected. We live in a nutso world and it's only getting worse at the moment. We have to fight back. Well, uh, one of the things that actually happens with these green energy funds, the Green Climate Fund is a hundred billion dollar a year fund that the Western nations are supposed to pay to uh, developing nations with no accountability. Uh, they haven't managed to put together a hundred billion a year yet. They've managed no. to get pretty close. I think they're 20 billion short or something but not per year. So some of these countries are now asking, I think India is asking for a trillion dollars and Africa is asking, I think for $3 trillion. Now what happens with that money? Um, uh, Professor Istvan Marko, before he passed away, wrote a couple of very interesting pieces on our uh, blog. And he called these COPs kind of a climate trade fair because you know all the countries come there and uh, say India will say well we, you know we would go renew renewable but we really don't have the money so Germany will say well okay we'll give you two billion dollars and they go oh that's great okay but you have to buy from Siemens you know so it's an economic development recycling scheme if you like actually for the West and then you still end up with all these developing nations with no real power, no central grid. And uh, of course, as you know, people are stuffing pockets left, right and center. Uh, yes. And it's money coming from hardworking North Americans and Europeans with uh, no I benefit to anyone, no benefit to the climate and only the elite and the um, carbon trading markets are cashing in. Yeah, so. I was at the UN summit in Copenhagen in 2009, I, I, I asked Rajendra Pachari, the then IPCC chairman, he did an event where he was touting uh, solar lanterns for the, for the, you know, the billion people without running water and electricity, which is fine. But this is the message of the United Nations. They're going to give out solar lanterns to people living in huts made of dung, in dire poverty, breathing, burning dung with a horrible air quality, with no infrastructure, with polluted rivers, with polluted air qualities. This is how the United Nations looks at it. But those are, and I've met these young activists, they travel the world. When I was in South Africa at a UN summit, they're, 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 I call them, you know, they're like poverty evangelists. They go around and they tell poor nations that they're doing it right. They're living sustainably and that the Western way of living is complete, absolute, unsustainable nonsense. And we have to be more like them. So the whole UN concept it's going to be people people making money, as you said, in all these different slush funds and schemes. But then there's the sect of true believers imposing that ideology, which is driving these policies, which really gets scary. And I just want to say the scariest thing about this is how COVID has empowered the administrative state, unelected bureaucrats, where it's not going to matter who you elect anymore because you're going to have a permanent bureaucracy with powers that they never even imagined just two years ago. Right. Well, I think we're getting close to the end of our questions. I, I wonder, would you like to talk a bit more about your book before we sign off? Give us a bit, a bit of insight on your uh, yes. green fraud. Uh, the book. Thank you. Yes, the the green fraud book. I go through. There's a whole thing about the UN Sustainable Development Agenda from the Rio Earth Summit. I actually have passages from the Sustainable Development Charter of 1992, and I compare it to the modern Green New Deal. It's literally the exact same language, the exact same, uh, just basically plagiarized from it. 
And then I have a whole chapter on the kids' climate movement. And I have the whole corporate climate crusade behind Greta. I go in great detail on the timeline, how Greta's story doesn't add up. Both of her parents, her dad was well-connected. Her mom was an environmental activist winning environmental awards. Yet Greta claimed that her parents were indifferent on climate, had no interest. Meanwhile, they were actual activists. She was set up. She actually never even went to school. She didn't skip school because she was homeschooled anyway, but she had a school that gave her a curriculum. So that whole part of it. But I also go in great detail about the kids suing the European government, the United States government for a livable climate, James Hansen's involvement, uh, the man who was arrested half a dozen times protesting climate, the former NASA scientist. So I go into all that. We, the, the book goes into the extreme climate scenarios. When current reality fails to alarm, use R, you know RCP 8.5, the most extreme scenario, how it's corrupted. You know, the national climate assessment reports is just about is garbage because they come out with scenarios and they scare the try to scare the public. But this is it. So I go through almost every aspect, a whole chapter just on the energy and electric cars and solar and wind and, and the whole folly of trying to mandate that. Um, so the book really does you know, cover this whole thing. And I try to do it in a very entertaining and fun way. And that's the way I try. I try to engage the general public, engage you know, this is good for high school kids. It's not a boring policy wonk book. I also feature Michael Moore. Remember, I was talking about working with people we don't normally align with. Michael Moore's Planet of the Humans. I detail how he was booted from the planet of the progressives because he questioned the holiness of, of solar and wind power and electric cars. And I spent a lot of time in the book detailing that. Michael Moore ended up getting banned from YouTube. He had his old progressive friends turn against him and tried to shut him down. So it's, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, how big and powerful they try to take you down. And I think the book goes through a lot of that. I also go through all the wacky stuff, shrinking humans. Uh, you know, I got the NYU professor in there. So it's got something for everyone. The whole agenda to push insect eating on us, the fake meat, Al Gore's quest to be the world's fake meat billionaire. It's literally, I think, a very entertaining book and eye-opening book. So thank you for this opportunity to talk about it, Michelle. Pleasure, pleasure. Well, thank you so much for being on our show and Thank you for informing the public and inspiring people. And um, uh, we look forward to reading your book, Green Fraud, and looking forward to your new one. So thanks. Um, I hope you have a good evening. And thanks very much for all your comments and for being with us. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Francis Simon. Well, that was great. <laughs> What a character, and so brave. I mean, he goes into these uh, COP uh, 25, 26, whatever number they're on, meetings um, without an entourage and knowing that he's walking into quote unquote enemy territory. So um, there are quite a few funny stories that he's got to tell about that. Now, uh, before we go, I wanted to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. Uh, I wanted to also thank our volunteer board. I am perhaps the best known person at Friends of Science, just because I'm the spokesperson, but uh, our board of directors makes it all possible. And they volunteer a lot of time just to get things put together like this event. So I'd like to thank our show producer, Mike Visser at the director's chair. I'd like to thank our technical producer, Jay, for all of her help. And I'd also like to um, thank all of our member subscribers who support us financially. We operate on about $150,000 a year and volunteer power. And uh, we don't have government grants. Uh, we don't have big sponsorships. So if you'd like to help us out, either you could donate on the donate button on our main website, or well, you can become a member and then you'll also get our cli -Sci and extracts, our newsletters that round up news that you probably wouldn't hear about. Or you can just send us an e-transfer to contact at friendsofscience.org. And, you know, if you can't help us financially, please share our materials. Please engage in the debate. We're not interested in making people agree with us. We're interested in sharing points of view on climate science. Our motto is that we're providing insights 
on climate science and related energy projects. So we want you to be better informed and better able to discuss these things with your elected representatives and with your communities because as we've seen with the energy crunch in Europe, these are now serious issues. It's not something about saving, you know, this little pond or this little type of duck. We're now talking about saving human beings. We're talking about entire communities being at risk with these climate policies. So, um, but I, I'm glad that Mark was very um, optimistic and, and, and interested in inspiring people to push back, to ask questions, to demand cost-benefit analysis. And those are very important things to do. So I think uh, we should take some hope and inspiration from him. He's been in this battle for a long, long time, and he's still fighting it, and he's still coming up with very funny um, observations about the world of crazy climate madness. So on that note, I'd like to thank you all again for watching, and um, have a good evening. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling. Good night.